All right. So last lecture on Monday, we talked about NMF, non-negative matrix factorization, and PNMF, which adds the projection functionality to it, allowing it to say um, project new data set. So that's the that's a specific difference. So for NMF, you only you're only interested in let me move here in decomposing this X matrix like the single cell count matrix we give you. But for PNMF, you want more. You want this projection functionality in that you want to project a new matrix, I call this X prime, which can have M additional new cells. And you hope to project them to the same R dimensional space as your original data matrix X, right? So both matrices will become R dimensional, like this one H, R dimensional instead of P dimensional. So you want to have a lower dimension representation. And this table just compares the three methods, PA, PCA we first covered, NMF, PNMF. So roughly speaking, you can interpret PNMF to share certain properties with PCA. That is the projectionality. So you can do projection, which will naturally make this W loading matrix close to orthogonal. And here, because you have W entries non-negative, orthogonality would imply this mutual exclusiveness of the original features contribution to different factors. So for example, P, as you know, is P, W is P by R or P by K. So K is number of factors and P is number of features. So every row, every column, I should say, every of the K columns is actually a loading vector, indicating the contributions of the P original features to each factor. And this having the columns of W close to being orthogonal and the entries are zero or positive, which means that you would in, you would inherently have mutual exclusiveness. So the genes participating for factor one will likely contribute zero to other factors. Otherwise, there's, it's impossible to achieve this orthogonality. So that's the thing um, embraced by PNMF. Compared to NMF, which is also non-negative, but doesn't have this orthogonality requirement because W and H can be unrelated. While in PNMF, we enforce H to be W transpose X. So therefore, NMF doesn't have so much high exclusiveness or sparsity. So compared to NMF, sparsity mutual exclusiveness are both higher for PNMF. And one more thing is that um, PCA doesn't have this mutual exclusiveness, even though it has orthogonality. And this is something we showed here last time. If you look at this, we cut the weight matrix, which is the analogous to the loading matrix in PCA. We have the original genes in the rows, and we have five factors called bases in the columns. So you see that the genes contributions to each basis are kind of noisy. But if you look at the PNMF, we have a clearer pattern. Like these genes contributing to bases one and these these for basis two, these for basis three. So they're largely exclusive and therefore they explain they or they can be explained by different functions if you look at a genes um pathway or gene ontology analysis. Yeah, gene ontology analysis. So that's what we are last time. And then we said that the specific method my lab developed called SAP and MF can allow us to select uniformity of genes. You just specify the number of genes you want. And we found that the genes we selected are more informative for separating cell types. If you know there are cell types, then just using highly variable genes. So that was what we covered in the last lecture. Today, we will cover the last linear dimension reduction method we hope to introduce, which is called independent component analysis, standing for uh, short as ICA. So independent replaces the P in PCA, and P stands for principle. 
Okay, so principal means the major. And here we want the components to be independent. So it's a different different jargon, right? In what's the difference between independent components and principal components? So when we say principal components, we actually mean that the principal component means the explanation of variance. So if the components are principal, they can explain a lot of the variance in our data. So the first principal component, first PC, is supposed to explain the most variation, most of the variance in our data, followed by PC2, PC3. And here, we ask the components to be independent. And independent is in the sense of probability and statistics or in the traditional definition of independence. So maybe I can, I think this is a good point to ask you a question. Um, what, what's your understanding of saying two random variables are independent? Maybe you have heard about this for, for a while, right? Many times, especially in statistics, we often say IID, which stands for independent and identically distributed. What do we actually mean by independence? There is a chat box. Okay, so there is a technical definition. We can factorize the joint distribution, joint density function of AMV as the product of their marginal probabilities, right? P of A and P of B. Thank you for the answer. But can you give me more intuition beyond that, beyond this technical definition? If I don't know any math, what, what will be your explanation of the independence? One value has no effect on another. Good, thank you for the answer. But when you say has no effect, what do you mean exactly? Because there can be multiple ways to define an effect. Actually, I think this might be a good time for me to add one more slide to explain this, which I think is something I recently realized myself, or even though I may have this understanding, but I wasn't as clear as this before. Therefore, I hope to use this chance to share this with you. Maybe I can just open a new slide here just for this purpose. Yeah, so what I'm trying to say is that independence versus no effect. So if you recall that, let me see how we can add text. Just give me one second. Okay, I need a text box here. So let's say we have y versus x, okay. The two random variables are both real valued. Both real valued random variables. Just I'm, I'm making the things simpler because we're just talking about them being one dimensional. Both are scalars. Okay, Tim has an answer that each event does not affect the probability of each other occurring. Yeah, this is the, this is, so you all give very good explanation. And Tim's explanation is for discrete random variables, right? Discrete random variables can be described as an event. Like if I have a coin tossing, I toss it, I got a coin at zero, that's one event, one value one as another event. People use the head and tail to explain. But for continuous random variables, the intuition is not so clear. How do you say, continuous random variable, how do you connect continuous random variable to an event? Because we know that for a continuous random variable, the probability of taking one particular value is always zero. That's the definition of a continuous random variable. Then what is the event? So I don't know if you, this is how you learned it from your improbability class, but to talk about event, an event for continuous random variable, you need to specify an interval for the value. Say, okay, if my continuous random variable x takes value in the interval zero to one, then that falls into the interval zero to one. That is an event. And this event may have a non-zero probability. But if it's a particular value, then that probability is always zero. Okay, so just after this clarification, I want to introduce this independence versus the statement, no effect. 
Because if we say, if we have this linear model, if we assume a linear model, which is what we have seen before, if we can write y equals a plus b times x plus error term. So in this case, when we say no effect, or x has no effect on y. Under this model, we mean that b is zero, the slope is zero, but this is not equivalent, but this no effect is not equivalent to the other statement. So if I say this, call this the null hypothesis, so this can be a null hypothesis H0, which is what we use in statistics, if you want to test whether the slope is zero or not. But this is not equivalent to another hy no hypothesis, that is x and y are independent. This is another no hypothesis, H0. So what is the difference? This difference is similar, I should say, this difference is equivalent to the difference between correlation or covariance, x and y being zero. So this implies correlation of x1 being zero, they are, equi they are equivalent, but they does not equal to x and y being independent. So this is something you might have learned from a probability class. That is correlation being zero or covariance being zero does not imply independence. So what is implying Corporate, but correlation being zero or covariance being zero does imply this. If you assume a linear model, then the slope is indeed zero. So they can be the same thing. So they can imply that each other. So let me just highlight the things that are equivalent. In blue. So these are what we can typically say no effect, but the independence is something stronger. Okay, so I'll use a different color, independence. Okay, so what really happens is, if I just go to one more line, is the red statements can imply The red statements does imply the blue statements. The blue statements are weaker, but not the other way around. But the other way is wrong. So you cannot say no effect implies independence. That's the thing I want to clarify. So then what is the most intuitive thing of independence? If I teach a probability class, I will say this, instead of throwing this mathematical equation to you first, that means the value y, the value x takes does not tell us any information about the value y takes. So y can take any value as if there's no x. So knowing x doesn't tell me any information about y and vice versa. So knowing the value of y does not tell me any information about x. That is the most intuitive definition of independence. And that's the independence by literally, right, independence. When we say two people are independent, that's what we mean, right? What one person is doing has nothing to do with what the other person is doing. And here is that their values do not, do not inform each other. That's independence. But when we say no effect, especially under the specific linear model setting, it becomes a more restricted meaning. It's about the slope. But it's very possible that we can construct a case where you have y and x being independent, 
oh, sorry, you have yx not independent, but the b is zero. So that's why I'm saying the other way around doesn't hold. So it's possible that B does not have this linear effect on Y, or I mean, X does not have this linear effect on Y, but they are not really independent. So, and there are some counter example cases you can find online. You can say, okay, what is the uncorrelated but not independent case? If you just Google for such a case, you can find some special cases like that. So therefore the thing is trickier when you have correlation and you want to argue for independence, it's not, straightforward it's not direct so and i've seen many such misuses of independence in some biomedical research papers so people may only have no effect but they are saying independent so therefore i think the take-home message i want to give to you is that be careful when you use the word independent and think about the original meaning whether you really have the independence in the probability sense not just no effect I hope this clarifies. But yeah, the other way, but 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 from red to blue, if you do have independence, you can say no effect. That's for that's fine. Okay, there is only one case where they are equivalent. Okay, I mean I can move here. So there is only one case where red and blue are equivalent. So if x, that's a special case. Maybe I should use a different color. So special case. When X and Y is bivariate Gaussian, when they follow a joint Gaussian distribution, so X and Y are bivariate Gaussian. And please also note that X being Gaussian, Y being Gaussian does not imply bivariate Gaussian. That's another thing to be careful. So if they are each marginally Gaussian, doesn't mean that their joint distribution are Gaussian. And there's also a counterexample you can find online. Like each of them is Gaussian, but together it's not bivariate Gaussian. But when we have them bivariate Gaussian, typically their distribution in a two-dimensional space, where each dimension is one random variable, is like a spherical. So if they're independent, then bivariate Gaussian is like a bowl and a round bowl. But if they are dependent, then they become like a spher spherical and make they become narrower and narrower. In the extreme case, when their correlation is one, it become a line. So you will see that change in the cor in the bivariate Gaussian shape as the correlation changes. But yeah, I can add one more example next lecture to help you recap. But this is something I will leave for today. So when X is bivariate Gaussian, then we do have red and blue equivalent. That is a special thing. Yeah, so that's the special case. They are equivalent, but otherwise in general, we have red implies blue, but the other way around doesn't hold. Okay, so therefore, Starting from my question, what is independence? I hope to clarify the difference between independence and no effect. Okay, so typically when people say no effect, they are talking about a regression setting. So in the regression setting, the slope being zero or other ways of saying there's no effect. So basically I'm, I'm skipping a lot of more complicated, uh, complicated cases, complex cases for regression. And we just focus on the linear model. Do we have any questions for this before we come back to ICA? Okay, so then ICA independence, that this independent is in this literal strict sense independence. We really need to have this independence uh, Evangeline wrote in the chat box, this PAB can be factorized as PA times PB. Okay, so then let's move on to the full screen. So both PCA and ICA try to find a set of vectors, a basis for the data. In PCA, the basis you want to find is the one that best explains the variability of your data. 
The first vector of the PCA basis is the one that best explains the variability of your data, the principal direction, PC1. The second vector is the second best explanation and must be orthogonal to the first one, etc. In ICA, the basis you want to find is the one in which each vector is an independent component of your data. You can think of your data as a mix of signals, and then the ICA basis will have a vector for each independent signal. Okay, so here is also important to know the difference between orthogonality and independence. There are two terms that seem related. So technically, orthogonal means the linear algebra sense. That is, when I take the first vector inner product with the second vector, I get zero. That's the orthogonality. But this independence in the second ICA, in the ICA, will require some distribution assumption. We cannot just say two things are independent without assuming some distribution. So therefore, as we will see later, we only use ICA for the cases where the joint distribution of our data is, non, is not Gaussian. And each component we decompose is not Gaussian. If they're all Gaussian, there's no unique solution for ICA. So that's something I hope everyone to remember. But in the, on the other hand, PCA is suitable for Gaussian data because what we're decomposing is the covariance matrix of a Gaussian distribution. And if your data has P dimensions, and if we assume that the N observations, in our case, N cells, follow a P-dimensional joint Gaussian or multivariate Gaussian distribution, then what we do for PCA essentially is to decompose the p-dimensional Gaussians p by p covariance matrix. We decompose that by eigen decomposition. We get eigenvectors, eigenvalues, and we order eigenvalues from the largest, the smallest. The first eigenvalue corresponds to the variance explained by the first PC, and the corresponding eigenvector is the loading vector of the first PC. That's what we do it for PCA. So we, we like the data to be Gaussian because then for Gaussian, you know the different the key, the nice property is that you only need mean and variance. With the mean and variance, you specify the distribution. And the mean and the variance are related, unrelated. That's why in your first homework, we asked you to check this mean variance relationship. And that is because of the property of Gaussian. All right. So the, the key difference is that here for PCA, it works well for Gaussian. While you want this ICA to ICA works well for non-Gaussian. That's the difference. So therefore they have very distinct uses. And I will tell you some intuition behind the ICA and its application in the following slides. So this is a very good example I found online about what ICA can do. So consider you have two images and they are actually considered to be independent sources because each image is taken regardless of the other. Right, so when we take this image, it has nothing to do with the other image. So they were taken independently. But this author makes them with different proportions to produce those two mixed images. So you see that the first image has more from the left image. Well, this one has more from the right image. So there is a chat. Let me see. Why is it common to use PC on RNA-seq data? That's a good question. That's exactly, so let me read out this question. So the question from Eric is, why is it common to use PC on RNA-seq data when count data is multinomial Poisson? Very good question. So that's why in CIRAD, if you recall, when we apply PCA, it was after normalization log 1p transformation in the hope that the data is like Gaussian. We're now working with the count data. And that was the criticism of the GLM PCA paper of that use, because they showed that figure, if you remember, that log 1p CPM is a, is a mixture distribution. You have a spike a, you have a point mass at zero and you have a bell-shaped distribution um, 
in the positive domain. So they're saying that the data is still not Gaussian. So that's why they propose to work with data, count data specifically, but to work with data, specific, work with count data, you cannot use PCA, then you use GLM PCA. Because for GLM PCA, the factorization happens in the transform parameter space. So it's not, you're not decomposing the count data's covariance structure directly, but you are decomposing you are assuming that the count follows some Poisson distribution, and you are actually decomposing the Poisson's parameter after transformation. Basically, you're assuming that the, the lambda of Poisson log lambda is in the linear space, and you decompose that into, PC, into PCs. So that's why they have the GL and PCA. So this whole logic is because PCA is not suitable for count data. That, that's the answer. Yeah, so you see the left one has more from the left image, and here this one has more from the right image. So when we use ICA, it's for this signal decomposition. What we hope is to restore the original two images from the mixes. So another original development from for ICA is, is the field called signal processing. It's an engineering field. So the question here is that if we have N people in the room talking to each other and we have some recorders placed in the room. So each recorder would record a mix of the sounds, right? It's not a sound from one person, but it's a mix. But how can we do decomposition? Then we can restore the individuals' voices so we can hear each person more clearly. That is a signal processing problem. And ICA was developed for that purpose. So you can see the similarity. Here we're mixing images, but in that scenario, we're mixing the sounds, soundtracks. Okay, so this is the ICA result. And from this Quora post, so you see that it's not 100% per perfect, but it's a very good separation of the two mixed images into the like the original ones, right? So this is the IC result from these two, while this is the original one. So you see the IC result is pretty close to the original one. Okay, in a, so basically when we compare the ICA and PCA, in the practical way, we can say that PCA helps when you want to find the reduced rank representation of your data. That's what we do for single cell data. We want to reduce the dimensions from say 2000 highly variable genes to 20 to 50 PCs to work on. So it's a reduced rank representation, but we hope to preserve most of the useful information in our original data. And ICA in contrast helps when you want to find a representation of your data as independent sub elements, independent sources. In layman terms, PCA helps to compress data and ICA helps to separate data. Yeah, this is something I want you to keep in mind when you choose between the two methods. How about NMF? In NMF, the basis you want to find is the one that helps you, helps you reconstruct the data as a positive summation over the basis vectors because you don't allow negative loadings. This means the basis will have vectors that represent parts of your original data. Remember that that phase NMF example, right? You have the arrows, you have the, uh, you have the, sorry, you have the noses, you have the mouth, you have the eyes, you have those parts of your data. If your data contains images, then NMF basis contains parts of image that will help you reconstruct any of your images in the data set. But if you look at this ICA result, it's not getting you parts, right? So that's not exactly the NMF. So that's why they are for different applications. So here are some points, bullet points, summarizing the differences between NMF and ICA. First, assumptions about data distribution. ICA assumes that observed data is a linear combination of independent non-Gaussian sources. It aims to separate these sources based on statistical independence. So you're basically doing a statistical modeling here to estimate independent sources under the assumptions that they're independent. 
On NMF assumes that the observed data can be represented as a linear combination of non-negative bases instead of independent non-Gaussian sources with non-negative coefficients. He seeks to find these basis vectors and coefficients. So non-negativity is unique to NMF, but not for ICA. Nature of components. In ICA, the components are statistically independent, meaning they are statistically unrelated to each other as possible. So that is whatever value this pixel takes here has nothing to tell us about what value this pixel takes right here. So there's, of course, no unique, no mutual exclusiveness. In NMF, both the basis vectors and the coefficients are non-negative, meaning they represent additive additive parts of the data. However, NMF does not necessarily enforce statistical independence among components. If, in fact, if you think about the components as mutually exclusive, like we have for PNMF, then they are not independent because mutually exclusive will tell you, okay, if I have a positive value in this factor, then this gene or this feature's contribution to other factors must be zero, right? You don't have independence. Independence means that, okay, I'm positive here, then you can be zero, you can be positive. I don't know, that's independence. But mutual exclusiveness is the opposite of independence. That's another thing I hope you understand. Okay, objective function, even though we didn't give you the technical detail for ICA, I hope you understand at the high level that ICA typically maximizes a measure of statistical independence as the objective function, such as negative, negative entropy or kurtosis to separate the independent components. NMF minimizes distance metric, such as the Euclidean distance. If we remember in that um, forbiddenness norm, right, between two matrices, that's the Euclidean distance or KL divergence. If we're working on other distributions between the original data matrix and its approximation using non-negative factors. So if you remember, our student Xinjo asked me the question last lecture about why we use Euclidean distance, even though the data single cell is count, right? So this is related to that topic. Okay, summary. Basically, the PCA, the main purpose, so now I'm going to give you one final example to compare the three techniques, PCA, NMF, ICA. The main purpose of PCA is to find a subset of features of our data set that best encaptures information on the whole data so that we can reduce dimensions with minimal loss of information. For example, we can shorten computing time by reducing the dimension of training image data before feeding it into a deep neural network for classification. So we're working with the reduced rank instead of original high number of features. PCA approaches this task by identifying principal components that are linear combinations of the original features. These components are extracted so that the first principal component encaptures maximum variance in the data set, the second captures the remaining variance while being uncorrelated to the first and so on. So we have said this again and again, just to reinforce your understanding. As an example, I think this is a very interesting example. We will use a data set of 982 images of the number four handwritten. Each image is of dimension 28 by 28. But before applying to PCA, we first reshape the data so that each image becomes a 1D vector of size 784, so which is the square of 28. And the full data set is of shape 982 by 784. So this is the M by P representation of the matrix with the rows for my observations, columns for my features. In here, the columns, the features are pixels. So these are some example images. To reduce the number feature to, to K using PCA, the reduced rank, we first compute the covariance matrix of the data set, which will be 784 by 784 covariance matrix. Then we compute the eigenvectors and the corresponding eigenvalues of the covariance matrix. <clears throat> To choose the k principal components, we first sort 
the eigenvector and eigenvalue pairs in decreasing order of eigenvalues. We select the eigenvectors with the k largest eigenvalues as they are the ones that contain the most information about the data. Finally, we obtain a matrix W of shape 784 by K. So this is a loading matrix, and we take its product with the transpose of the data set to obtain a data with reduced dimension K by 982. So you have the still the 982 images, but each image is represented by K reduced dimensions by PCA instead of the original 784 dimensions. Okay, to reconstruct data that has been reduced, we simply take the product of the reduced data with the inverse of the matrix W obtained previously. So because W has, let's see, W has its columns orthogonal. So basically, I think here is the abuse of the term. I will say transpose. I will say this is a transpose of W. So because you only have inverse for a square matrix, I will say the transpose of the matrix W obtained previously, W transpose. In doing so, we obtain data that has the same dimensions as the original one, which is 982 by 784. Finally, we reshape our 2D data to a 3D matrix of dimension. You restore the 28 by 28 images so that we have a set of images we can visualize again. So then the authors compute the reconstruction error and you can compute, calculate the mean square error comparing each image pixel between the original image then reconstruct the image. So if you want to see the code for a detailed calculation, it's in this blog post. So basically we can see the reconstruction error the lowest, highest is just like the lowest among all images, highest among all images, and average across images. So you see that the number of components, as you increase it, the reconstruction error goes down, which is something you would expect. If you just keep two PC, the error is very high. You lose much information. But as you go to, if you go up to 256, the error is already pretty small. Okay. The results above show that the more principal components we take, the lower the reconstruction error is. This is because the more dimension is reduced, is de decreased, the more we lose the original information that can be used for reconstruction. A common way to choose the best number of components to take that optimizes the trade-off between dimensionality reduction and information is to calculate the explained variance of PCA for each, each number of components and choose the number of components that has variance between 95 to 99. So this is like the variance explained. We talk about only say PCA. But remember that for single cell data, when you run SURAT, I can say that for most cases, you wouldn't preserve so much variance. If you keep just 20 to 50 PC, maybe you will get 70 something variance instead of 95 to 99. Because if you want to reach this, you will keep a lot, a large number of PC. That's the, that's the thing for single cell data. And what this implies is that single cell data really has a pretty high noise ratio, or we can say the signal to noise ratio is pretty bad. So you have a lot of noise. So therefore the remaining pieces you don't keep, right? The, the later pieces you don't keep can explain a large proportion of variance themselves. And that's what we consider to be the noise variance. But, but still there's no clear separation of signal to noise unless you make assumptions. The reason is that we just have this matrix and it's unsupervised learning. So we don't have additional information to help, you, help us. But if you do have the cell types, if you can annotate the cells as types, then that's different because the cell type can be used as the label you want to predict then becomes a supervised setting. So that's just something I want to say about this percentage. This ensures we do not lose too much information about data. All right, this is for this one single image. We look at its reconstruction from PCA by using two PCs. This is two PCs, 16 PCs, 64 PCs, 256 PCs. So what? which one would you say is satisfactory if we go from left to right? We increase number of PCs. Of course, the reconstruction is getting better and better. But where would you be satisfied? Which one would you be happy with?
if our goal is to keep a smaller dimension for data compression. I would say everyone, different people may have different choices. Yeah, some people say 16, which is this one. Yeah, and my pick might be the 64. <laughs> yeah, so I think different people may, may have different thresholds for tolerance level for the noise. Yeah, thank you for the answer. Now, ICA. Now we have 1,000 images that are combinations of the four handwritten numbers. So it's a different setting, but still about handwritten images. 0, 1, 4, 7 with varying ratios. So this is the mixed data, just as the one we have seen before. We're mixing the images. We want to recover the source image from the mixed images. So maybe you can see these two have what, a bit more of 7. This one is like one and four, right? This one is zero and one. So you have different proportions of mixes. You want to recover that. One approach to separate linearly mixed signals is by independent ICA component analysis. Mixing of signals can be defined as a matrix product where H is the matrix containing the different source signals. This is the same setting we have for NMF. W defines the ratios of the sources during mixing, and X is the mixed output. So here the sources themselves are the basis we are interested in recovering. And W, the weight matrix, actually has the weights of the sources, how they are mixed into the output Rx. Then ICA aims to recover the matrix W so that we can compute H as W transpose X. The same thing we have for NMF for the projection, but that is for projection. Here we call this reconstruction because H is the original source. ICA cannot be applied to just any mixed signal. First, the mixed signals must be a linear combination of source signals for the reason illustrated by the previous matrix product. Next, ICA assumes that the source signals are independent, while the mixed signals are not, as they share the same source signals, and uses this fact for a separation. Finally, ICA also assumes the source signals are non-Gaussian and uses the central limit theorem, which you might have learned from a previous statistics class, which implies a sum of two signals has a distribution closer to Gaussian than the two signals on their own. So this is about the algorithm design for ICA, which we didn't cover. Like how do we enforce this independence in our objective function? But basically, these are the things we should bear in mind. Non-Gaussian is the key thing. All right, so this is what I see, how I see it works from, for this data. Does it look good? Maybe not so nice, right? The results of I see above reveals it has been able to extract the images 0, 4, 7, and to somewhat recognizable degree, 0, 4, 7. But it was not able to extract the image 1. This should be 1, and 1 is like a mix. And instead, it returned an image that seemed to be several of the source images overlaid together. What's the reason? Now it's brainstorming, or it's a, just a question time. Why does ICA not work so well for one? Is it because basically there's a lot of ones in four and seven? And... Exactly. Yeah, exactly. We cannot say the original sources are independent. I think that's the key. So like this one is one and you have something like one and one right in the four and seven. So the images have some similarity among themselves. So they are not generated independently. That, that's the problem. So you, you basically violated the independence assumption of your sources. So this is very different from, this is very different from this image. If we go back to this, this thing, Terminator movie. So because for here, the two images are so different. So like having the some shapes or pixels right here doesn't tell us any information about the other image. So they are more different, more, more independent, seem, seem to be so. And also if you think about that voice recording example I gave to you, signal processing. So it's very like the, the speech pattern of one person can be very different from the other person, right? Including the frequency. So, so that's why it's easier to separate them within the ICA. But 
This example is not a, an example that ICA is perfect for because one just has some similarity with four and seven. So they, it's like part of four, part of seven. So that's why we do a very poor job for one. But interestingly, NMF work very well on this. You see the four sources separated by NMF. It's actually very good. In the second approach, the separate mixed signals is NMF. Like ICA, NMF also aims to decompose the mixed data into a product of matrices. But there, here, there is the added constraint that each matrix X, W, and H are non-negative. This constraint provides an advantage in applications where data is inherently non-negative, which is exactly the case we have for image data. For those grayscale image data, white means zero, Black means one. So we have the zero to one transition. But on the other hand, it's just one dimension though, and it's all non-negative. Or I shouldn't say one, maybe the maximum is not one, maybe like 255 or something, but it's non-negative. So it's it fits the assumption of non-negative of NMF. And also by reinforcing that the decomposition W and H being non-negative, we are also only getting like zero or non-zero here. So which will make the data pattern, like the pattern of the decomposition, I shouldn't say data pattern, the pattern of the decomposition sparse for better interpretability. So this is based on the H matrix obtained and reshape it to have the 2D images before saving visualization. So you see that the four sources separated by NMF is very nice. Okay, actually, I already <laughs> answered this question. So this was my last question I placed at the end of lecture. So why do we use PCA in single RNC data analysis pipeline? And I think Eric's question was also related to this. So maybe before we wrap up this part, I want to have a volunteer to answer this question, just to restate or summarize what we have said so far using your words using your understanding. Why do we use PCA in single cell RNA seq data analysis? For what purpose? If you can just use one sentence to say the purpose. Is it to isolate the independent? Um, since the PCAs don't overlap, you can basically, in a sense, isolate the most important factors uh, separately. Um, but why do we want to do this? Right? This is like a, this is like a reason for. I I would say this is like the reason for choosing PCA instead of. NMF or ICA. But what my uh, but if, but if you go one level higher, why do we want to do this in the first place? Okay, so the answer is reduce dimensions. We just want to have a smaller dimension to work on. That's the thing. Yeah, and there's an answer because a lot of information, a lot of normalization makes data Gaussian tries to, yeah, that's a good answer too. Try, try to make the data Gaussian so it becomes the PCA is applicable, but I wouldn't say because, because like the date, make data Gaussian is not a reason. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's for the purpose of using PCA. So the logic is that first we want to reduce dimension. Okay, we want to use dimension and we want to preserve information in our data. That's the two things we want to achieve. Therefore, PCA seems to be a natural choice, but PCA requires data to be Gaussian, but single cell RNA-seq data is not Gaussian. Then we use transformation to make data Gaussian. So that's the whole logic flow. Okay, so thank you. So that's all for the linear dimension reduction. So of course you can see that I added more things to this introduction beyond PCA, because I think for the techniques such as NMF and ICA, they are very good to know, and you might find them useful in your research someday. So let me switch my slides to the next one for the remaining time.
Just give me one second. Computer still loading to open up the PowerPoint. Why is it taking so long? Let me. Okay, maybe I'll try another approach. Just give me a second. I think my computer is stuck again, even though the Zoom is still working. Okay, so. I think it's the PowerPoint issue. I'm trying to open it on the Dropbox. All right, so maybe let's start from here. So we will move on to the next step, clustering. Can you see my screen? Okay, great. Yes. Okay. So yeah, we just finished talking about linear dimension reduction by introducing PCA, GLM PCA, MDS, and the needle method for choosing number PCs. And you will see that the needle method will be used today for today's clustering part. Again, it will be a useful procedure for when we look at the elbow plot. And, and sorry, there's a typo, NMF, PNMF, ICA. And then clustering. Next step. So in Sierra, after we reduce the dimensions, we want to cluster ourselves into clusters. And the hope is that each cluster may represent a potential cell type. Because you know the most important task for doing single cell data generation and analysis is to discover previously unknown new cell types in the tissue. That was the major reason, one of the major tasks of single cell data analysis for for using the valuable data we generate for the first time. So then what is clustering? So clustering belongs to unsupervised learning together with dimension reduction. So unsupervised learning only works on one matrix, this X matrix, M by P. So in the standard way of writing N by P, even though sometimes we write P by N as you have for SURAT, which is P by N, or I think for the NMF, that term, that, that um, how to say, the, 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 the equations we introduce for NMF, it's P by N. So it's very important to see what is N, what is P, what is row, what is column. So in the N by P representation, N is the number of observations and P is the number of features. Right, so dimension reduction, which we have covered in several lectures, try to find the low dimension embedding of the end observation, say R dimensional or K dimensional, whatever you call it. Clustering is another technique applied to this matrix, but here you're not trying to project this matrix to a lower dimension. Instead, you want to partition the end observations into clusters based on similarity. So you will define some groups for your rows. What is a cluster? A cluster refers to a collection of data points aggregated together because of certain similarity. And as is the challenge for unsupervised learning in general, for dimension reduction, the challenge is how do we determine the number of dimensions? Right, how do we choose number of PCs? And we use the elbow plot for visual inspection, and we use the needle method for automatic detection of the knee of the knee or the elbow. 
For clustering, the same question, a similar question is, how do we define the number of clusters? How many clusters is enough? That is the most important question we want to address. And of course, given that you define a cluster based on certain similarities, if you change your similarity measure, then you may get different clustering results. So the results always depend on the similarity you define. So the simplest and most classical clustering algorithm, the one, the first one I want to introduce is k-means clustering. So I want to do a survey here. How many of you have heard about or used k-means clustering before? Okay, we have how many hands? Two hands, okay, a few more. A total of like about 10 people who give a positive response. Okay, which is good, which is already more than close to half of the class here. All right, so K means clustering as the name stands, K is the number of clusters. Okay, so you need to specify this number K before you do the clustering, which refers to the number of centroids you need in the data set. A centroid is the imaginary or real location representing the center of the cluster. Every data point is allocated to each of the clusters through reducing the in-cluster sum of squares. So what we do exactly is that if you have k centroids, then you assign each data point, each observation to the closest centroid. And then each centroid basically represents one cluster. And then given the assignment, you update your centroids. So it's like an iterative algorithm, which is very intuitive. And here in the name, k is the number of clusters. Means here, the plural, means is in the k means refers to averaging the data. So for every cluster, you have one mean, and that mean is the centroid. And you have k means, so that's why you have the plural. That is finding the centroid. So you want to find the centroid in your cluster as the means. So how the k-means algorithm works? To, pr pr to process learning the data, the k-means algorithm in data mining starts with the first group of randomly selected centroids, which are used at the beginning points for every cluster, and then performs iterative, repetitive calculations to optimize the positions of the centroids. It halts creating and optimizing clusters when either the centroids have stabilized, there's no change in their values because the clustering has been successful, or the defined number of iterations has been achieved. So you reach the maximum, so you don't want to go further. The most common algorithm used as uses an iterative refinement technique. Due to its ubiquity, okay, it's often called the k-means algorithm. It is also referred to as the Lloyd's algorithm, which is the standard k-means algorithm, particularly in the computer science community. So this is sometimes referred to as the naive k-means or standard k-means, because this is the simplest one, but later there are faster alternatives. So this is just a very brief overview of the algorithm from Wikipedia. So given the initial set of k-means, and we denote them by M1K, what M1 to MK for the K clusters. So K is the cluster index, and we put a super index one, superscript one for the initialization. That's the first set of centers. And please know that they should be of the same dimensions as your data points. If your observations data points are p-dimensional, then M1 to MK are also p-dimensional vectors. The algorithm proceeds by alternating between two steps, assignment step, update step. Assignment step, assign each observation to the cluster with the nearest mean, that with the least squared Euclidean distance. So like we said, when we need to define clusters, we need a similarity metric, or the opposite of a similarity metric is a distance metric. So for k-means clustering, the distance metric by default is the Euclidean distance. So mathematically, we can ignore this explanation. Basically, what this means is that for cluster i, I'm just explaining this notation. For cluster i in iteration k, 
okay, an iteration T. For cluster I in iteration T, it's defined as a set of your data points, X, P. So P here is just a, it's just an index of your data point. It has nothing to do with dimension. So just make sure that you don't confuse this P. It's just any data point X, P. So if this data point X, P is closer to the to the i-th center, then any other cluster center j, then I assign this xp to this cluster i. That's basically what this equation says. Okay, when, where each xp is assigned to exactly one of the clusters, even if it could be assigned to two or more of them. So this is something worth attention. So regarding assignment, so if we assign this data point to one cluster only, we call this hard clustering, in which we don't allow a point to belong to more than one cluster. But there is a soft clustering version, which will assign one data point to more than one cluster by some proportions. That is, if you believe that the proportions, you assign the proportions for k clusters and they add up to one, then essentially this data point can somewhat belong to all the k clusters just with different weights. That's soft clustering. But here we are just talking about hard clustering. Every data point to one cluster. And they can serve different purposes and for depending on the use, right? If you want to define, say, cells as cell types, then it makes more sense to have hard clustering because you believe every cell should have only one type, but that's just my, my interpretation. Okay, so for update step, then given the assignment for each cluster I, you now have the data points in this SI set. You want to update your cluster center in the T plus one, iteration. And as the name stands, K means you calculate the mean of the data points in this cluster. And you call that the ith cluster mean. And then given the new set of means, you go back to the assignment step to update the assignment, and then you update the mean. So it's always assignment, update, assignment, update. And the algorithm converges when the assignments become stable, no more change. However, the algorithm is not guaranteed to find the optimum. What is the optimum? We haven't said that yet. But based on your understanding, what is the optimum? Say we have K clusters. How do we define the, these K clusters to be the optimum? Any thoughts or ideas? You can think maybe for like five seconds and then I'll give you the answer. So there are many ways to partition our data and data points into K clusters. Then which one is better? Okay, Calvin has a very interesting answer. The optimum is that the clusters represent cell types. Good answer, but this answer is requiring cell types, right? It's actually the supervised learning setting. It's not just based on the X matrix alone. But what if I just have this X matrix what is a reasonable definition of optimum? Think about PCA, variance preservant, pre, pre, preserve, preserve, yeah, preserve variance. Yeah, so Leon, you have an answer? No, I just think about, you said K means is supervised. Wouldn't that mean that you're kind of mapping out um, certain characteristics that closely resemble the, um, the like the actual answer that you're mapping it to? No, I'm saying that Calvin's answer is supervised. He, it requires cell types, but we are talking about an unsupervised setting where we don't have cell types. So we only have this matrix. So then the answer is close to what we are aiming to achieve for PCA. We hope that once we calculate the variance within each cluster, and we add up the k variances, this sum is close to the original variance in my data. That's the optimum. So you have the best partition. Yeah. Or oh, actually, no, I think I made it bad. I, sorry. I think I sorry. I think that was a that was a that was a wrong answer, my bad. So I, I aim to say the opposite way. 
So for k-means clustering or the optimum, you know what we have, we want, we, what we want to say about the clusters being good. To be good is that they are very well separated, right? Mm -hmm. By being well separated, we want each cluster to be homogeneous. That means the data points in the cluster are indeed similar. So what we aim to achieve for optimum is that if I have the between cluster variance is close to the total variance. And compared to the between cluster variance, the within cluster variance is small. That's the optimum. So you, because for every, for every partition, you will be able to calculate within variance for each cluster. So you have K within cluster variances, and then you have a between cluster variance just from the K means. You can take the K mean centroids and calculate their variance. What you want to have is that the K means the between cluster variance is big, while the within cluster variance is small. So that's what we will we'll, we'll see in a later slide when we look at how to choose K. We want to find the elbow in which the within cluster variance decrease and to a point that the further increasing K doesn't make the decrease more obvious. So we'll see that. All right. So this is like an illustration, but I think the cartoon here is stuck because it's not PowerPoint, but let's come back to this to see the iteration next time. So this is a demonstration of the standard algorithm, just to cartoon illustration of the algorithm we just showed you, right? So if you set k equals three, and these are your data points, you first randomly pick, pick three points to be the center, centroids, then given the centroids, you assign data points to the closest centroids. That's your assignment. Given the assignment, you update your centroids. Okay, so maybe it shouldn't be like the one you pick in the beginning, but it should move to somewhere else. So you're updating your centroids. And given the update, you redo the assignment. And given the assignment, you recalculate the centroids and then you redo the assignment until the assignment stabilizes. That's the standard algorithm. But as you can see that initialization is what we need. How do we initialize the centroids? So this is also from Wiki. So there are two major initialization methods, the 4G and the random partition. The 4G method randomly choose K observations from the data set and use them as the initial means. This is what we're showing here. You randomly choose three from the data. The random partition method first randomly assign a cluster to each observation. So basically you just randomly assign a label one to K to each observation. Then you do the update. You just calculate the mean. So in other words, you specify the assignment first instead of you specify the assignment instead of specifying the center. So one 4G specifies the centers, centroids, random partition specifies assignment. So one or the other. Okay, then the random partition does compute the initial means to be the centroids of clusters, randomly assigned points. The 4G method tend to spread the initial means out while random partition places all of them close to the center of the data set. According to this paper, there, these two initialization methods have their specific advantages. The random partition method is generally preferable for algorithms like the fuzzy k-means. So we don't talk about the k-harmonic means because it's just a different way to define the mean. We use harmonic mean instead of our algorithmic mean. But for fuzzy k-means, it's like you allow the soft clustering. Every point can be assigned to more than one cluster. But for the hard k-means, the standard k-means, the 4G method is preferable. You want to specify the centers so they spread out. And following on that, there is a very interesting algorithm proposed in computer science called k-means++. plus plus. It's just for initialization. What it aims to do is try to make sure that your initial centers are forced to spread away as much as possible to cover your data points. So then you are better at, uh, you are better at um, how to say, reaching the global optimum instead of being trapped at a local optimum. So this is just two images showing what do we mean by global optimum versus local optimum. Here we just have four data points. This is a tall example, very clean example, A, B, C, D, the four data points, and we set K equals two. So the left one is a local optimum, which is that, which, which stucks, 
but which is stuck, but it doesn't, it's not a global. We we, are, we cannot go go up, go out of it. So you see that A and D in one red cluster, B and C in one blue cluster. But clearly here, the within cluster difference is smaller than the within cluster differences are bigger than the between cluster differences, which is not desirable. On the other hand, on the right, this is the global optimum A and B in one blue cluster, C and D in one red cluster. So here the between cluster distance is large within cluster distance is small. So basically when we say K means plus plus, we want to choose initialization that will help us better recover the right one instead of the left one. All right. So we will stop here for today. So in the next lecture, we will, the, the hope is that we will finish k-means. We we'll talk about how to choose k, and we'll talk about hierarchical clustering. Then finally, we will move on to what is actually in SURAT, the Louvain clustering, which is based on graph cut, which is not k-means, which is not hierarchical. But I think after that, the question is, why do we use that? So I think it's always it's always interesting to think about why one algorithm become popular for one application. What's the underlying reason for that? So knowing this will be very useful for your method development if you are interested in developing methods yourself. All right, so then that's all for today and I will see you on Monday. So we will see what the university says about the instruction. So we'll see what's the guideline for next week. Thank you.